Okay. In this lecture, I want to discuss linear systems. And, <clears throat> well, linear systems, linear ODEs, uh, I assume that you saw in a previous lecture. So first we do how to solve them. Uh, in a recap example, second point of today, I want to look at the distinctions between continuous time, that is to say ODEs, flows, versus discrete time. That is to say, maps, systems. I want to discuss the types of uh, equilibria. Or periodic points. I want to introduce a new notion, namely, Structural, structural stability. And the main theorem for this lecture at the end, that is the theorem of Hartmann-Gropmann. on conjugacy to the linearization. And I think that's enough for one lecture. So let's start with an example. And the example that I had in mind is an initial value. problem and it's linear so the differential equation will simply be this where a is an n times n matrix and I have an initial value which is then some vector in Rn. Well let's be very specific I take n is 2 I take a is a particular matrix that is going to be 11 minus 18, 6, 10. And the initial vector is simply 1, 0. So how did we use to do that? Yeah, well, abstractly, you can say Well, I just take the e power of this matrix. So x of t is going to be e to the a t times the initial value, where, well, we need to recall what an e power of a matrix is. Well, e to the power a, and I would like to call this b, is, uh, ah, it's um, the same, type of uh, Taylor series as you also find for the real exponential value. So it's going to be a sum over all uh, k greater equal to zero. One over k factorial times uh, e a to the power k. So this works very well, except that it is entirely abstract and we do not really know how to compute this e power except by diagonalizing the matrix. So find uh, diagonalizing the matrix.
diagonalizing a matrix uh, is something that is a bit cumbersome. And you'll always make mistakes with it. So uh, I prepared this in advance and, and this is what you get. So D over here is indeed a diagonal matrix and these two values are of course the eigenvalues of the matrix A. And here, these columns are the right eigenvectors of A, whereas these rows are the left eigenvectors. again, of course, of A. Now, the nice thing is that once you have this diagonal form, you can immediately compute the nth power uh, by simply putting everywhere n's, that is to say, on the A, on the D, uh, but not necessarily, you don't have to put them on the U. So for any n, we get this. And if we recall that B, is e to the a, what, e to the a times uh, just e to the a, which was this sum. Uh, then we can also find the solution as follows. The solution x of t is e to the a t x zero, and that is going to be u e to the d t u inverse, which gives, oh, I forget x zero, which gives uh, u e to the minus t e to the two t u inverse, of x0, and this is what I computed explicitly, and it's going to look like this. It's minus 3 e to the minus t plus 4 times e to the 2t minus 2 e to the minus t plus 2 times e to the power 2t. So this is a combination of uh, the eigenvectors applied to uh, e to the minus t for the eigenvalue minus 1 and e to the 2t for uh, the eigenvalue 2. And we can do the face portrait of this. So let's use it in blue. Face portrait. Now we have those two eigen uh, vectors. Let's start with the second one, the expanding one. So that is two to the right and one up. And so this direction. And in that direction, we have expansion like e to the two t. And we have a contraction in the direction of the other eigenvector, which is, when I count it out, is 3, 2. So in this direction, we have contraction, e to the minus t. Okay, maybe for good measure, let's say this is 2, 1, and this thing, this point here, this is the point three, two. So along the green line, you have contraction. Along the red line, you have expansion. So you can ask what happens in between. Well, in between, you try to follow more or less uh, uh, what you 
what, what, what the green and the red line say. So for example, if I start here, kind of follow the red line, but at this point, the red line will take over. From this side, I follow the green line, but the red line will take over and send me away. And if I start between those two, um, then if I follow the green line, at a certain point, the red line will take over and we get these kinds of turns. And this is the face portrait of what is called a saddle. The origin is a stationary point, is a saddle point. <coughs> Something more about this uh, about this uh, this matrix U, I can use, or actually more like the matrix U inverse. I can use that as a change of coordinates. A change of coordinates. Also called conjugacy. Because what it does, it takes these eigenvectors, let's say the red, and maps it back to the coordinate axis. So if here are the coordinate axis again, and then the image on the U inverse of the, of the vector 2, 1 is going to be the unit vector in this direction. So this would be 0, 1. And then the differential equation would move along the horizontal axis in a way because it still goes like e to the 2t, whereas uh, for the other direction, which is the green, that vector 3, 2 is mapped by u inverse to the vector uh, 0, 1, and along this vertical line you have contraction, like e to the minus t, and the purple lines here, yeah, well, they behave as something in between, so that will more or less look like this. And in this way, we have straightened the saddle point so that now these uh, expanding and contracting direction are nicely perpendicularly, perpendicular. And that gives a, well, a, a nicer picture to look at. So, so far for this example, uh, Let's have a look um, about what types of uh, stationary points you can find in a um, two-dimensional ODE. Okay, let's now make a little bit of a table what kind of notions we have for uh, linear systems. Uh, and then I make the distinction between continuous time on the left and discrete time on the right. So for continuous time, we have an ODE, which looks like this. Whereas in uh, discrete time, we have a map. So this is an ODE. And this is a map. Uh, F of x. It's going to be b of x. And I still think of b as e to the power a to have the connection between the two. <coughs> so the solution, so this is the map, the solution will have this form x of t is e to the a t times the initial value, and sometimes we like to use this notation, uh, and this is called the flow. In discrete time, we have a sequence of points, uh, which 
can be found by simply iterating this matrix. Uh, so this gives the orbit. And n is in z in this case. That's discrete. Uh, the origin is always uh, fixed. That is, on the left-hand side, it's a stationary point. On the right-hand side, it's a fixed point. Uh, so the origin is hyperbolic. Well, this means that if I take the eigenvalues of lambda, uh, the eigenvalue of a, so a lambda is eigenvalue of a. If that has a non-real part, then we call it hyperbolic. In the discrete case, uh, we take the same thing, but now we ask ourselves if the uh, absolute value, the modulus of this eigenvalue, in this case, this is the eigenvalue of B, if this is on the unit circle. Okay. Uh, sorry, it shouldn't be not on the unit circle. Okay, then we have particular types of these hyperbolic ones. Uh, it could be a sink. And the origin is a sink, namely, if the real part is always negative, for all eigenvalues lambda. And here it's a thing if all the eigenvalues are less than one for all eigenvalues of B. Okay. Uh, the opposite of a thing is a source. And that's what you get when the real parts of the uh, <clears throat> eigenvalues are positive, then the stationary point is a source. The fixed point is a source if all the eigenvalues are larger than one. So for all eigenvalues of B. And it could also be that one eigenvalue has a negative real part and the other has a positive real part. And in that case, we call the stationary point a sink. And the counterpart for uh, the fixed point for a discrete time linear system is when the one eigenvalue is inside the unit disk and the other eigenvalue is outside the unit disk. And of course, then you can ask yourself what happens if there are eigenvalues on the imaginary axis or on the, um, on the unit circle. So in that case, lambda 1 and 2 are plus or minus i omega. And uh, in that case, we speak of a center. Uh, and note, this is non-hyperbolic. And then finally, on the discrete part, it means that lambda 1 or 2 are both on the unit circle. And that means they are the e power of a purely imaginary number. So that's the case there. And uh, a little remark. If the eigenvalues are plus or minus omega, uh, then uh, instead of using complex eigenvalues, <coughs> I'm going to use a rotation matrix. D is cos omega t minus sine omega t. 
sin omega t cos omega t in, in the formula a is u d u inverse uh, it turns out that this form uh, is much more transparent than using complex eigenvalues so that's what I would suggest in this case. So to illustrate these, uh, these notions, let's just draw some, some face porters, what they look like. So let's start with a sink. And that is to say that the real parts uh, of the two eigenvalues of the matrix A are, say, both negative, both real. And yeah, that means that we have two attracting uh, eigen directions. Let's say they're this direction and this direction. And let's say this is lambda 1. Uh, it's the stronger, and therefore I indicate it with a double arrow. And this is lambda 2. Uh, is the weaker one, but still attracting because the real part is still negative. In fact, it is negative. Let's assume that in this picture. And that means that if you start here, well, uh, you can decompose this vector, this purple point, into a part in the direction of lambda 1 and a, direction, a part in the direction of lambda 2. And you can see because lambda 1 direction is more attracting than the lambda 2 direction, uh, the solution is going faster to zero in the lambda 1 direction. So this is going to be the shape of the curve. And we see this in all directions. Oops, it should of course go to the origin, but it goes faster in the lambda 1 direction than in the lambda 2 direction. So that's the sink. And, well, I didn't write it, but I was just assuming that lambda 1 and lambda 2 are both uh, purely real negative numbers. So let's do a source where, uh, in this case, uh, um, the real parts are both positive. But in this case, I want the real parts to be the same and indeed be complex numbers. So in fact, uh, lambda one and two are some alpha plus e to the plus or minus i omega, where alpha is positive. In that case, uh, <coughs> there are no uh, real attracting directions. Instead, and let's say these are the coordinates axis, so this is the x axis and the y axis, or the x1 axis and x2 axis. In this case, the behavior is spiral. So it's uh, a source, so unstable, so we move away from the origin, but this goes in a spiral fashion. Uh, so, this is a spiral type of it. Okay, let's also do a center. So, in this case, uh, the eigenvalues are on the imaginary axis. Oh, I see here that I made a mistake. Uh, there's no need to put the e power, it's okay to just do plus or minus i omega. And that's what I want to have here as well. I just want a uh, zero real part and imaginary part is plus or minus i omega. And in that case, it's no longer expanding, it's no longer contracting, it's non-hyperbolic. Uh, instead, the 
movement is more or less circular or more appropriately it's in the direction of an ellipse. I think it goes like this. And if we also say that is the initial point, um, okay, uh, let's say that this P1, P2 is initial value. Then we can uh, actually solve what this, what this curve is. It's going to be an ellipse. And the origin is actually surrounded by all these periodic solution, all of them ellipses. This is the force phase portrait. And uh, there is a very standard example where this uh, particular center occurs, uh, namely, for the harmonic uh, oscillator. So, example, which is called the harmonic oscillator. That is a differential equation of this type. Second derivative of x as function of t plus omega squared of x is equal to zero. Now this is the second order differential equation in one dimension, we can, but we can reduce it to a first order differential equation in dimension two. So I'm going to use coordinates x dot, and it's the same x as that, and y dot, which is something else, because uh, I'm just going to say that x dot I want to recall, rename to y, and if y is x dot, then y dot is x double dot, and that is equal to minus omega squared x. And now we find that this can be written in this form, and here we have our matrix A. And you can check Uh, the eigenvalues of this matrix are exactly plus or minus i omega. And in this case, I was suggesting a few minutes ago to diagonalize this using a rotation matrix. And it turns out that the solution is going to be uh, z of t is uh, P1, uh, the first column of this matrix, plus P2, the second column. And if I'm not mistaken, I have you uh, made uh, by this choice, I have satisfied the initial value that indeed, and um, when t is zero, this particular point comes out. So, so far, uh, phase portraits. I now want to go to the next topic, and that is structural stability. Structural stability is uh, the property of a dynamical system that under small perturbations, they do not disappear. That is to say, uh, a system is structurally st stable if uh, nearby dynamical systems will not have a bifurcation. So the definition that I want to write down is a property of a dynamical system
is called structurally stable. Structurally stable if it persists, so still continues to hold under small perturbations. And as a matter of fact, we can specify this as bits. I can call this CK perturbations and then call this CK structurally stable if uh, uh, if the perturbation is small in the CK norm, Uh, which is the following. So if I have the original dynamical system and I have the perturbation, then the CK norm, that is simply <coughs> uh, the supremum, or let's say the maximum, for I is zero up to K, and then the supremum over all X in the phase space of the derivative, the i-th derivative evaluated in x minus the i-th derivative evaluated in g. That is to say, a C1 structurally stable property means <coughs> Uh, that, um, well, let's write it like this. The existence of a hyperbolic uh, stationary point or in the discrete time, a periodic point is C1 structurally stable. Because whenever you have a hyperbolic stationary points, if you change your ODE a little bit, then the stationarity of the point doesn't change. So nearby, there is still a stationary point for the perturbed system. And also the derivative at this stationary point hasn't changed much. So if it was uh, a derivative not on the imaginary axis, it will still not have uh, a, a uh, derivative on the imaginary axis. Okay, so uh, let's just apply this notion of structural stability to hyperbolic stationary and hyperbolic fixed points in the continuous and discrete time setting. And in both cases, we need the implicit function theorem, which I uh, put down again on the left. And so have a read through it. Um, but I want to make one more remark to it. So, uh, and that's the remark that I will use in a minute. Remark. It is possible to replace the Rn, that is to say, this Rn by uh, a function space, uh, the space 
CK of K times continuously differentiable functions. And nothing changes except uh, that W then will be a subset containing Y0, which is then a function, a subset of this uh, space of functions. And to every point in this subset, we, and every function in this subset, we assign a point such that this still holds for this point and this, in this case, function. So let's use this remark to uh, prove this thing. In two cases, first let's do the um, uh, discrete time. So in this case, we have a fixed point. Uh, is a fixed point, and we're going to choose f x uh, in g to be f of x minus x plus a function g. So again, this is a CK function. Uh, into R N. And uh, clearly, this is zero because X zero is a fixed point. And also, this is invertible. at this point x0, because x0 is hyperbolic. In particular, in particular, the derivative of this thing is not zero. Okay. Hence, the remark that I just gave the remark gives us there is A function, a CK function, uh, such that um, F of H of G, G, which after all is going to be F of H of G minus H of G minus G, uh, is zero. And that's equivalent to f of 
h of g, that's the point, minus h of g, minus, well, this is a function, so I want to evaluate it in a function, and I want to evaluate exactly in this point. <clears throat> uh, okay, I think I need a plus here, because that's how I define it. And that's equivalent to saying that f plus g, both evaluated at the same point, is h of g. So there we have our fixed point. So I think I will skip the uh, discrete time, uh, sorry, the continuous time. It goes exactly like this, except that we will not, I can just say, uh, in continuous time, uh, the term minus x is not used. Because after all, we're not looking for fixed points, but for stationary points where f of x is equal to zero. So the next topic is linearization of, uh, of systems. So let's start again with the continuous time. So there we have this OD. Which, when we linearize it, instead of this f, we take just the derivative uh, at, at the particular point. So we're going to linearize around the point, and this point, let's call it x0. So the linearization of this ODE would be x dot is the function value at this point, plus a times x minus this point, where a is the derivative of f at this particular point. <clears throat> and so the former system is a perturbation of the linearization Because, well, we can write x dot is f of x is f x zero plus a times x minus x zero plus g of x, where this thing here, uh, the perturbation, is big O of the square of the distance to the point around which I linearize. <clears throat> now this is the discrete case, well, uh, sorry, continuous time for discrete time. And then the nonlinear system is, uh, is this map, x goes to f of x, and the linearization would be x goes to f of x0 plus b of x minus x0. And where b is the derivative, and the derivative I can write with straight axis in this case. in the particular point. And the reason why I wanted to call it B is because that's what I have done throughout the lecture. Uh, B can be e to the power a, but I just want to write it like this. Okay, so uh, if we describe these, uh, the face portraits of the nonlinear versus the linear system, it's going to look a little bit like this. 
So now we do the face portrait. And let's say here is this point x0. And in the linear case, the x0 is here as well. But the difference is that uh, over here, uh, let's say this is a saddle. That means that in one direction, it attracts points. And in the other direction, it repels points. That means we have a stable set. And the standard notation is that WS for stable is a curve of points that move under uh, the action of this ODE towards the stationary point. But uh, the system is not linear, so there's no reason why that goes along a straight line. Whereas over here, it will be a straight line and straighter than I can draw. So in this case, the uh, stable set is actually x0 plus the uh, stable eigendirection. Okay, and then for the repelling direction, we get uh, the unstable set, that is the wu of x0, and then in the linearization, it will look like this. Still unstable, so this would be the unstable set, which is, in fact, x0 plus the unstable eigenspace. Now it would be nice if we could relate the two four face portraits and more specifically if we could see this one as obtained after a change of coordinates from this one. That is to say if there is some conjugacy H, such that it moves this dynamics to this dynamics, and that is indeed the case for hyperbolic uh, stationary points and also hyperbolic fixed points, and that is the contents of the next theorem, which is due to Hartmann and Grobner. Okay, the next result is the Hartmann-Grobman theorem, which is meant to explain or actually justify the existence of a conjugacy that in these phase portraits moves the one portrait to the portrait of the linear system. And we have a version for the discrete time and a version for the continuous time. So let's write them down both. So if F is a C1 map uh, with a hyperbolic fixed point x0, then there is a neighborhood uh, which I call U, and a homeomorphism H from U into uh, H of U, such that, well, it should fix this fixed point, also under the homeomorphism, and, uh, and the dynamics on the one side and the dynamics on the other side should be the same. And that is to say, F composed with H is the same as H 
at x0 plus a, no, I call that b, x minus x0, the whole thing uh, composed with h. And in that case, it's probably better if I just write uh, a, a dot here. Because uh, how we should interpret this formula is that this point, h of x, needs to be inserted over here. Now, this is the linearization, if you remember. <coughs> and if h indeed satisfies this property, then is h is called a local because this is only true for all points in this neighborhood, conjugacy. Okay, so that's the um, discrete version and the continuous version uh, looks similar. Uh, so if f is a c1 function and x0 <coughs> uh, is a hyperbolic a hyperbolic stationary point Then uh, there is a neighborhood U of this stationary point, a homeomorphism H from U to its image, such that, well, in this case, it's still true that h of x0 is x0, but the other formula is a bit uh, um, takes a bit more care uh, because oops, yeah, it takes more care than I put in it. H composed with phi t of x is equal to x0 plus e to the a t of h of x minus x0. Okay, to explain this a bit, well, this is the flow. of this differential equation, x dot is f of x. And this is again uh, the solution of linearized ODE. <coughs> so that's what the, the, what the theorem is like. And I want to make one more remark before I give a sketch of the proof. Uh, we want not just any H, we want an H that close to this stationary point or fixed point is very close to the identity. That is to say, uh, um, If we stipulate that H is near identity, and then
then the solution of this problem, finding this conjugacy, finding this local conjugacy, uh, then this solution is unique. And uh, what again is near identity? Well, uh, I would like to, to express this like the inverse of H of X is going to be X plus some V of X. Now that of course is the identity map and that is a perturbation such that if I take V of X, this should be, um, of order x squared. All right. Okay, now for a sketch of the proof of the hartmann goldman theorem. Uh, I first want to do the discrete time case and I keep in mind that I'm looking for a near identity solution of this problem. Okay, so first of, of all, uh, without loss of generality, we can say x0 is simply the origin. And then uh, we can write f of x is, well, f of x0, and it is a fixed pointer, so this is going to be 0, uh, plus b x minus x0 plus g of x. Well, this is simply going to be 0, and x0 is 0, so this is simply this. <coughs> and what we want to find a solution to a solution to the following problem. Well, H composed with F is the same as B composed with H. Okay, and that is equivalent to well, I apply H inverse both on the left and the right. <coughs> uh, so the H on the H inverse on the left will cancel with this H, but I get another one on the right. And here I will get the one on the left, and the one on the right will cancel. And that is equivalent to, naturally, uh, H composed with H inverse composed with B inverse in minus H inverse is zero. And again, uh, since I want to uh, find a near identity solution for H. Uh, we want to find a unique solution of this equation. Okay, let's decompose it a bit further by inserting what f is, because f is this one. So then we get that zero is, well, f is b plus g composed with h inverse composed with v inverse minus h inverse. And now I'm going to recall that h is a near identity. So then I get the identity plus this perturbation from the identity, that is this formula. Composed with B inverse minus the identity plus V. And that is still equal to zero. 
Okay, so now I want to rewrite this still a bit. Zero, and what I'm going to put apart is, is that. Uh, I want the V, and I want uh, this here. Um, I'm multiplying the whole thing with minus one, and then I get B composed with V composed with B inverse. Okay. Plus G composed with the identity um, plus V composed with B inverse. Okay, now I need to make sure that I have the signs correct. So, this, ah, I see, this is a minus and that is a plus. So, this term is this term. Um, uh, this term is, of course, this with everything. And now B times the identity by B inverse, that's the identity, and that cancels with this identity, and B composed with V composed with B inverse, that's what's written here. So it's the same. And now this object I would like to call L of V, and the whole object I want to call Psi of V and G. <clears throat> okay, and then, uh, well, this psi, this complicated expression is equal to zero, and we can remark that psi v of g is equal to zero if and only if theta of v, which is in fact L of v minus psi of vg, And to this, I apply the inverse of this operator. If this operator, so this uh, different color, uh, if this uh, new operator called capital theta has a fixed point. Okay, do we see that? <coughs> Okay, so LV minus psi. This is LV. Put a psi on this side, I get G. So this object here is in fact the same as G composed with identity com plus V composed with B inverse. But if this is zero, that means that uh, this G thing is actually the same. Uh, so this is if psi is zero, this is the same as L of V. So then this is L of V, and I take L inverse of V, and well, that's indeed a fixed point if this is zero. So that is more or less the explanation of, uh, of this rewrite. And now we use the uh, the big machine of uh, the Banach fixed point theorem. So one can show that this operator T is a contraction. on the Banach space
of k times differentiable functions mapping from u into Rm for u uh, a sufficiently small neighborhood. So then it's just saying Banach contraction principle giving you a unique fixed point V, so a unique uh, age inverse, which after all was the near identity, identity plus V. And that conclude the proof for the discrete time. And now the board is full, so I have to clean once more to do also the continuous time, which is much shorter and much cleverer. So now the last part of the proof, uh, which is the continuous time case. And again, without loss of generality, I will put x0 to be equal to 0. And I just kept what we learned from the discrete time case. Uh, so we had a unique near identity solution to this equation where f was the map, okay, the map. But now we are looking at the continuous time. So we're looking at a flow and we now need a near identity Identity solution to the following equation. Uh, now we have the flow which I didn't uh, which I denote by phi t compose h inverse. Composed and uh, this is going to be the equivalent of this one, e to the minus a t uh, x is the same as h inverse of x. Okay, so the difference is that we now have a flow, nonlinear, and the h which we need to define, and this is the inverse solution of the linear problem. And uh, so now it's good to remember that b, this matrix, was actually e to the power a. Okay. So, uh, and the other thing that we can do is for t is 1, we send that the time one map, which is flowing with this V of t for time one, we can call that equal to f. And then we'll see what will happen. So this fixes this time one max fixes x zero, which was zero because x0 is a stationary point, it is fixed for all time, in particular for the time 1. Uh, uh, and if we use time 1 again, then the previous solution Uh, of h being the identity plus v inverse gives phi 1 composed with h inverse composed with e to the minus a because t is 1 is equal to h inverse. 
also, well, let's write uh, it like this, V1 composed with Vt, composed with H inverse, composed with A, oops, that should be an E power. E to the minus AT, and the whole thing composed with E to the minus A. <coughs> well, I can swap these things. Uh, if you first flow, flow for time T and then time for time 1, is the same as first flowing for time 1 and then flowing for time T. Okay, the H inverse I copy, and here is another pair that I can swap if I first take this matrix and then that. Because it's the same A, I can swap them and I can get this, and then E to the minus AT, and I can put my brackets here. <coughs> uh, but I know what this is, because that's the solution here. So this is the same as Vt composed with H inverse composed with E to the minus A T. Okay, so, and now it's only one more step, which is however quite tricky. Uh, namely, if I call this thing here H tilde, well, that thing I also have here, H tilde. And then I see that H tilde is a solution of this equation. And then I recall that this here is actually B inverse. So H tilde is a solution to the equation. Oh, I also recall that this here was actually F. So again, H tilde is a solution to the uh, equation f composed with a tilde composed with b inverse is h tilde inverse. Let's call this inverse. Okay. Okay, so it's the same equation as here. And we know this has a unique near identity solution. And that is to say that this thing here is actually the same as H inverse. And that means the same H from discrete time works for, yeah, for this one. And let's call this star for all time. Well, for all time, such that we stay in this neighborhood on which H is defined. Uh, but that is indeed what we want to show, and that is the end of the proof, and also the end of the lecture. So thank you for your attention.